So for those who don't know me, my name is uh, Paul Watts. I'm the uh, Chief Information Security Officer at Domino's Pizza Group, PLC. Uh, and I've been in post about four months. Uh, prior to that, I did four years in critical national infrastructure. Uh, and prior to that, to that, I did about uh, eight years in the bank. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's why I haven't got any hair left. Um, and um, the week before I was supposed to do this, I was out in Vegas. Uh, one of the, uh, the perks of our job is every year... Uh, Domino sends about 9,000 of their people out to, uh, out to Las Vegas uh, to our worldwide rally. Um, and there's about 9,000 9, people here. And this gentleman here, which I'll burn with my laser pen here, uh, Rich Allison, who is our incoming CEO elect, uh, taking over from Patrick Doyle, who's standing down. Um, and uh, he was about 20 minutes into his keynote and uh, suddenly started talking about information security. And the CIO poked me in the ribs, and then I got a text from the other CISO who was in the room. Um, and he said, um, he said, it's a significant part of our business success, um, but it doesn't mean that we need to be any less innovative if we're going to worry about uh, cyber security as well. Uh, and it struck me that um, for the first time, I just heard a business leader talk about the fact that, uh, and recognising that security um, can be a business enabler. And it isn't just something that happens as part of a cycle of specified build, you know, does it work? Um, and, and Domino's has had to take this really, really seriously. So we are a, uh, in the QSR sector, quick service restaurant sector, uh, recently overtaking Pizza Hut as the number one pizza brand uh, on the planet, which we're really, really proud about. Um, but what we are now is an innovative, data-driven technology company. The reality of the situation is, is, is Domino's is actually uh, a B2B and B2C organisation. We provide the collateral and the capabilities for a franchisee to open a Domino store and sell pizza uh, and make a lot of money in, 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 in the process of doing that. But because we've suddenly become a hugely data-driven organisation, um, we've, we've had to be really, really sharply focused about cyber security. And Rich called out that there are two things that keep the boards awake at night. One is food safety um, and one is cyber. Um, I thought, great, he's, uh, he's bought the T-shirt, so my life's a lot easier. Um, but there's still a spectacular hill to climb. Uh, and I'm sure we've all been in that situation where, you know, your, uh, your, your board or your boss says cyber is really important. And you say, well, what is it about cyber that worries you? And he says, well, I don't know. Um, but it's one of my two big risks. Go fix. We live in a world where, you know, innovation and disruption are key to an organisation's strategic success. Uh, and somebody mentioned it in the, uh, in the last panel session, you know, the idea of running just to keep still. That's absolutely true. Uh, and the value of data and the risk of inadequate protection of that data uh, is a business killer. So you've got to balance the two. You've got to balance that risk with reward, that agility with safety and security. Um, and, you know, for security, we'd rather that the business walked, but the reality of the situation is absolutely this. The business will go running off into the distance and you know, we chase after them or we're alongside them in the race. Um, Domino's, and I'm sure they won't mind me saying this, is a very young organisation. You know, I've been, I've been used to working with people like, like, like Andrew down here in the CNI space where um, there's, a, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of suits, lots of civil servants, they like death by committee, things are very slow, is all resonating with you, sir? Yeah. Um, Domino's is just like 20 children running across the field, giggling, going, yay! You know, why are you running across the field? And they go, I don't know, but it's bloody great. Um, and not realising why they're running. But that agility is actually quite refreshing. But as a CISO, it's also quite scary because you've kind of got to make sure that they're running in a safe uh, in, in a safe way and not just running for the sake of running because sooner or later they're going to trip over their shoelaces uh, and, you know, as my mother always used to say to me, if you break your leg, don't come running to me. Uh, the, the same is true in an agile organisation. The business is going to run anyway and they're going to run with or without our help. The truth is we need to make security um, add value to the organisation and be a business enabling capability and not just that group of people that sit in the IT department and mark our homework at the end of a delivery of something or pick up the pieces when we screw up. Uh, and it's dead easy to screw up in a world of cloud uh, because the business will just go out and buy this stuff and go, I just kind of bought this technology and I might have broke something. And we have those conversations. A number of business leaders and, and some CIOs actually would argue that information security has been disconnected from the core of the business for quite some time. Um, and I can relate to that. You know, I've, I've, I've been there, you know, who are you? I do security. You're the IT security guy. Well, I'm more than that. 
You know, we dropped the moniker of IT security a long time ago and we talk about information security and now we're transcending into cyber security. The reality of it is, is we're trying to help the business make informed decisions about its own destiny. We're recognising that the business is theirs and we're there as a trusted advisor. Um, um, the, the IT, yeah, the, the CIOs now get asked awkward questions. Um, they go to these business dinners, they go to the IOD and then they come back going, well, what's this cyber security thing? I ask the CIO, what's cyber security? And the CIO says, oh shit, I, I, I hired that bloke to talk about this. I need him alongside me now, he's my protective shield because I don't understand some of the questions I'm being asked, therefore I can't answer them. And, it, and if, if the impression is that it's on me to protect our business, then I need to be informed. Um, Equally, customers are now starting to get really interested in this stuff as well. Uh, the, the recent Facebook Cambridge Analytica has been a real catalyst. I'm not going to say GDPR, oh, damn it, just said it. Um, these things are actually starting to really get the customers to think about the importance of how organisations and businesses handle their data. It's business killing, decision making or breaking conversations that our customers are having with us. Do you take my safety and security seriously? If you don't, then maybe I don't want to do business with you. Um, so you're finding as CISOs and security leaders that you're being brought closer to your, to your board and closer to your leadership team, but that's not happening everywhere. Um, I think the alignment of security and, and, and business isn't necessarily a broken relationship, but, but in some cases a misunderstood one. The evolution of, uh, of the C-suite, the IT security manager into that C-suite board level role kind of signifies the fact that it is an important board level business killing risk that we're trying to deal with. Um, and I, th I do believe it's very important that the CISO has a seat at the table or a conduit to the seat at the table or the ability to inform the seat at the table sideways through audit and risk committees and, and, and that sort of thing as well. And if, as an IT security leader, you lack that capability, then I think you have a problem. Um, and that's something that I would compel you to try and fix within your organisation and align yourself with your business um, and be that critical friend. You know, you're not there to stop business. This is a, a stigma that's been attached to security professionals for many, many years, that we're just there to say no to everything. The reality of it is, is that the... The CISO now needs to, be, needs to manifest themselves as an entrepreneur, an ideas person, a value creator. You need to demonstrate that you can add value and enrich business propositions and business strategy and not be the one sat in the corner going, no, I don't think we should do that. I don't think we should do that. I don't think we should do that. You know, going back to what I said earlier, businesses will run regardless of whether we're there or not. Um, and if they make a mistake and trip over their shoelaces, you'll still get the blame. Guaranteed, you'll still get the blame. So it's important that the business recognises us in the same way that they recognise their innovators and their, and their, their strategists within their organisation. We can be a part of that too. There's a perception um, in uh, information security in, in a number of organisations, not necessarily all, is that we are a regulatory body of a business, that we're very passive um, and we just do risk management and we're not necessarily adding any value um, you know, we're the, we're the passion killers and uh, we take the fun out of everything. If you work in an organisation like, like mine, uh, that's got a much younger generation um, in the, uh, the organisation, then you, you, you manifest exactly that. Uh, in, the, in the older, more mature organisations, I think there's a balance to be had there. But even in those spaces now, banking, finance, and even in the public sector to a certain extent, they're recognising that actually security transcends compliance. Um, Organisations need to balance risk with reward. Um, and it's not about minimising your risk to a level that actually kills your ability to innovate. It's about striking that balance. The only way you can do that is through conversational, um, conversation and engagement with your business. Um, when, I, uh, when I worked in critical national infrastructure, um, I inherited a team that, that, that was stuck in a rut. They were annexed into the security and to the IT organisation, and they just weren't seen as adding any value. And one of the first things that we did is we got the organisation to engage. Security has to be a cog in the machine of your organisation. If, if you're the cog and you're sat outside here, you're not adding any value at all. Um, when was the last time that you took your security teams out and you put them in a business, you embedded them in the business and you got them to learn and understand the mechanics of the business? In Domino's, we take that really, really seriously. In fact, uh, a couple of weeks' time, I'm being sent to pizza prep school um, where I'm, I'm taught the business of making, baking and selling pizzas. 
And, and the business strongly believes that I can only add value to a business that I know and understand at the coalface. And it surprises me the number of security teams who never get to feel the business that they work in. Now, how can you add value to a business or perceptively add value to a business if you don't understand the business that you're serving? If all you see is risk, risk, compliance, regimen, access management, you're not adding value. If you're not having conversations with your business, you're, you're not adding value. Um, and I would, um, I, would, I would strongly consider that you go through this. And there's one thing that I wrote down here is, uh, you know, when was the last time that you looked at your business and you considered uh, doing security in a different way because the culture in the business had changed? Or do you just simply follow ISO 27001 prescriptively and to hell with what the business is trying to do? Uh, in December, I spoke at um, this event in London, actually, uh, about how you build a security culture in an organisation. Um, and the business has got to meet us in the middle. You know, I say often and oft uh, often and often again when I speak, the security is a collective responsibility of a business. And that level of engagement with your business is absolutely key. Otherwise, it's always going to be a them and us. You know, security has to be done with an organisation and not to an organisation. We're never going to be seen as business enabling if we don't Bridge that, bridge that gap, bridge that divide. Um, I've still got the slides in terms of how and some of the ways that you can draw engagement with your business. And Andrew spoke uh, last night, and if you were fortunate enough to sit at his table, about how you build an effective uh, awareness and, and culture within an organisation. Um, that engagement with your business from, from bottom to top is, is absolutely key uh, in terms of being able to add any value to an organisation. Um, one of the techniques that works really well is actually tapping into those, those um, interests in security within your organisation using uh, a network of security champions, for example. You're much, less, much more likely, I should say, uh, to get wind of a prospective project that might be bringing the organisation to risk if people feel comfortable to engage with you. And that method of engagement might be through somebody who's working in that particular department or function who feels safe and comfortable in having a conversation with security knowing that you're not going to trample in there and kick down the doors and do the whole Sweeney thing and take the keys out in the ignition. You're going to say, well, OK, you want to do that. Let's think about the safest and most efficient way of doing that to balance risk with reward. <clears throat> I'm still getting over Vegas, so uh, bear with me when I'm going through these slides. Uh, this is a controversial thing for uh, old school CISOs. Business will innovate with or without your help. Um, and I think that agility requires a bit of give and take on both sides. We're not very good at bending the rules in security, and we certainly weren't five or six years ago. The rules were the rules were the rules. But organisations now that want to move as quickly as they do today and have that degree of agility, you've got to recognise that actually sometimes those rules can be bent ever so slightly or adapted. It comes back to what I said earlier in terms of the... Um, you know, the last time you reviewed your policies because your organisation's ethos and culture changed rather than GDPR coming in or the NIST directive or something like that causing your, your governance to change. Um, it may actually be that your tolerances to risk in the organisation have changed and you can take your foot off that regulatory gas pedal just a tiny bit. Um, I'm not suggesting that you, you break the rules all over the place and, and adopt a devil-may-care attitude to security, far from it. But what I'm suggesting that you do is you need to have a balanced conversation with your business to recognise the pros and cons of moving outside of the sphere of regulation within your organisations to achieve a business objective and balance risk with reward. Um, and it's this whole idea of shifting left the conversations about security within, a, within an organisation. And, you know, I mean, when I moved out of banking and finance and I, I, I worked for about 18 months in a, one of the large UK retailers, you know, I was the one that was the problem because I sat in these meetings and they said, well, we want to do digital transformation and we want to do this. And I went, you can't do that because the policy says, and they were just getting frustrated with me. And I recognised that actually <clears throat> it wasn't my business. You know, I was there to be a critical friend. And actually, it, it was OK to encourage conversations about maybe taking a little bit of risk for a little bit of reward, but making sure they understood the consequences of their actions. And, and that's a, a different way of operating in terms of driving better security engagement in an organisation. Um, but it has to be done quite early in terms of the art of the possible. Um, if the business just goes away and delivers something and it's really, really high risk, you know, the, the cost and of, of reversing that and repairing that damage is... is is, is prohibitive. So the idea of shift left um, is something that I encourage when I work in, in security for all the reasons that I've talked about. 
in terms of the earlier the engagement in a project life cycle, the earlier engagement in a, the shaping of a business strategy, the more, the more useful uh, um, and the more constructive conversations are about security versus risk versus reward. And it, in, and it stops us just having that conversation about saying no or that worry that you've then got to unpick something that's already been delivered into the organisation and into the, into the business. Um, and one way um, that this can be done quite effectively is, is changing our approach to management of security in projects and programme lifecycle by um, incorporating a security by design, which is a, an obvious principle. And we talk about it when we're working with our architects and our IT teams to talk about security by design. But it can also be security by design when you're designing a business strategy or delivering a philosophy, you're understanding the culture of the organisation. Um, and these, these conversations are enabled if the security team are accessible to the business and they're prepared to have those conversations and they're prepared to make certain concessions or are prepared to negotiate the way that the business operates in order for these goals and these strategies to be, to be realised. Um, <clears throat> if you look at it in the context of a software delivery life cycle, you know, it's, it's, quite, it's quite obvious, isn't it? I mean, we've done all of this stuff before. The earlier and the, le the further left in the life cycle you are, the cheaper it is to implement your changes, the cheaper it is and the easier it is to, uh, to change tack in a solution design in terms of a business strategy or business goal. If you're doing it all the way over here when you're already in production and you realise you've made fundamental mistakes in the planning and design or the feasibility was even the wrong call, it's impossible to undo that. And I've, I've seen a number of, of successes uh, in the last sort of four or five years, certainly working in the CNI space where we've taken the... Um, well, I mean, the way it works in CNI is, is they'll do all their design orchestration and then the product will go for accreditation. Um, it will go to a, uh, an accreditation panel to be signed off. Its safety case and its security case will be signed off. If it's wrong, you know, in some cases you're coming all the way back to the start. What, what we started to do was actually do some of that accreditation right back in each of these stages as an iteration. So we were evaluating and accrediting the feasibility, the planning, design, development, testing. Product. Once you get to this point and you're going for formal accreditation, it's a formality. And suddenly everybody's cool with the idea of security by design because it's not done anything to disrupt the flow of this project. If anything, it's enabled the project to be delivered much more slickly because you're not getting to a particular stage gate in your development life cycle and the security team going, you can't do that, it's illegal. You can't do that, it breaches policy one, two, three, four, five, six. I didn't know about that. Did you know about that? Dave, did you know about that? The project manager screwed up. What are we going to do? Spend more money and have to start all over again. There are demonstrable benefits in reductions in cost, improvements in security by inherent design through the whole life cycle of an asset or service that you're delivering. Um, and it is the key to a successful project delivery. You can integrate security into your business without disrupting the value and the agility of your business. One of the things that we're doing in Domino's as well is baking security into our incubation and innovation hubs. Um, as I said, we're a, you know, QSR, Quick Service Restaurant, is a highly competitive and becoming very claustrophobic and crowded marketplace. Uh, and in order to maintain our market share, we have to be seen to be innovators. We have to be disrupting the market all the time. So innovation is really, really important to us. Um, but what we're now starting to do is bring the security resources into the same hub, whereas historically they would sit outside and the innovators would come up with this really, really cool product and they'd bring it to market and the board would get all excited and security would look at it and go, no, you're not doing that. But what we've done is we've taken it, the, the same security capabilities that we would use in traditional project lifecycle and we've moved that into the incubation and innovation. Um, we get the guys involved in hackathons that we do. We get the guys involved in conversations right across our international markets. So we can bake the implications of security, risk and reward into our innovation as well. It means that new technology can be delivered safely with lower cost and greater rewards. Um, and if it doesn't feel like it can fly, we can have those earlier conversations about actually whether the legislation in the organisation needs to be adapted to allow us to value, value add and allow us to innovate. Um, <clears throat> and it comes back to the point that sometimes the, the rules don't necessarily fit the, uh, the organisation that we want to be in or we're, or we're always striving towards. Um, and as I say, it, it is quite important to recognise that sometimes your approach to information and cybersecurity needs to change because of the culture 
of the organisation and, and the philosophies of the organisation changing and not necessarily just the regulatory black backdrop that uh, the organisations sit within. One of the other issues that, that we have as security professionals is when you go to the boardroom with your big scorecard and you say 98% of viruses were stopped at the mail gateway and we had 20,000 pieces of spam and the CEO is going, I don't give a shit. What's that done to my bottom line? It's really, really important that we, we think about how we measure and demonstrate the return on the investment in security in an organisation. We need to be able to link key performance indicators in security to key indicators of strategic goals and milestones within an organisation as well. Um, I guarantee to you that you will get a better audience with your financiers and with your, your chief executives and boards if you can demonstrate that security is driving or has an alignment to profitability, to margin, um, to greater investment in your organisation. Um, and similarly, that you can demonstrate that the security customs and practices that you have in your organisation are intrinsically linked to the organisation's ability to be agile and innovative. And I would encourage you to go back and look at your balanced scorecards and ask yourself that question. If you've got 20 key measures that talk about security, how many of those actually line to the organisation's strategic intention? It might be something, you know, front and centre. One, 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 in, uh, one in Domino's is reputation management. Well, if our security is inherently weak or we're leaking data, then there's a potential risk that our reputation is going to be damaged. You know, it is quite easy to look at how metrics can be translated into business benefits and business outcomes. But I'm staggered sometimes when um, you, I talk to colleagues in the industry and they say, can't get engagement, no one will talk to me. And I say, well, how are you talking to them? He said, well, I said that, you know, Symantec's 99.5%, but uh, they're just not going to buy into that because it, it doesn't resonate with them. You've got to speak their language if you want their engagement. How many, how many people think that they've got that covered? Because I, I really struggle with one. Yeah, I mean, everything you said just chimes 100% with the, my approach to what we're doing in the The only way to get board attention is first of all to be relevant and secondly to have their trust. You get yeah, those two things and you will change the organisation rapidly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it, is, it is really important. Uh, you know, I used to, I, I made, made, made mistakes when I was uh, a little bit greener than I am now. You know, I just expected the business to understand what I was saying. Um, and and, a, and a, lot of, a lot of people who have come from a, this is a sweeping generalisation, so I, don't, I hope I'm not upsetting anybody by saying this, but if your career path has come from a, a, huge, a highly technical sphere, so you've been, you know, you might have been an ethical hacker or a developer or something like that, and you've, you've moved into, into this space, and you've suddenly found yourself being a business leader, but you've not equipped yourself to speak their language and be that hybrid person, you know, you realise that you're, you're hitting that barrier when you're, you're talking in your language and they're not hearing it in, in theirs. It, it sounds obvious, but I see the mistake made over and over again, and I used to make it myself. So now when I think about the message I want to convey, I, I make sure it's translatable and it's in their language. Because I, you know, I, I don't need to provide them with a PowerPoint presentation and a glossary of terms, and I'm very guilty of the three-letter acronym. That's something from the CNI space, death by TLAs. Um, and I get pulled up on it regularly in Domino's. I said, stop speaking in code, speak English. It's right, we have to meet our business in the middle. You know, we're adding value to the business. The business doesn't, shouldn't have to be expected to understand what we're telling them. We have to provide that translation. How are we doing for time? Um, just in summary, you know, the days of security being seen as a roadblock have, have to go um, because business will run so quickly that we'll be either running to catch up with them or we'll be picking up the pieces of broken crockery as they're falling out of the backpack as they're running. We either have to get in front of the business or run alongside the business. Um, and embedding sustainable security programs into the fabric of the business are absolutely key. Um, and not just be the regulatory body that's uh, five minutes, can I have six? Six and a half? S seven? <laughs> right, we're nearly done. Embedding, the, embedding security deep, and, and, and I say this you know, every time I speak, so that security is a collective responsibility. If there are people in your organisation that don't think security is their problem, have a conversation with them, because they are potentially, and uh, we, it, was, it was touched on in the panel, you know, people can be your weakest link, but they can also be your strongest line of defence. 
um, but they need to recognise that they are part of your security operation. You know, they, they, they are the people who are out in the annals of your business. You know, as a, as a security leader sat in an HQ, I can't see across 1,250 stores and franchises. I haven't got a cat's hope in hell's chance. I need them to meet me in the middle. It's not just about buying clever machine learning and AI and network analytics tools. You know, somebody going, this doesn't feel right, is <coughs> just as good. <coughs> Fortunately for you guys, I'm losing my voice. Um, <coughs> If you're, if you're not there, if you're not with a the business, they're just going to do it anyway. They're going to get the company credit card out. They're going to go and buy a SaaS service. They're going to pump data into it. And the first time you realise you've got a problem is when that data gets lost, polluted, damaged, or, or worse. Um, weak security practices just amplify um, risk as velocity increases. And we've already talked about that as well. But conversely, exceptionally strong security practices annoy businesses that want to move quickly. We have to make compromises and our business has to work with us. And, th and that's the key message I'd like you to take away here. So we have to recognise that security as a function needs to be as adaptable and agile as the business it operates within. Um, let's recognise that. That's really, really important. Getting the security leadership in your organisation heard ha high up in the business as a value creator and an, uh, as an ideas person. And that opens corridors of conversation <coughs> rather than just being the yes, no person. Reconnect your security teams to the core of your business. Take your security team and just drop them, in, you know, whatever sectors you work in, maybe not you, um, because I don't want to, you know, that's just going to end badly. But if you have the opportunity to get your people embedded and spend some time with the business, again, that opens up channels of communication. Be prepared to bend the rules of convention in the name of agility. That doesn't mean that you break the rules. It doesn't mean that you stick two fingers up. Um, to uh, Elizabeth Denham and her shiny new um, procedures and rules. It just means that you need to work within the confines of the business to sometimes you know, push the boundaries of your regulation to achieve a reward. But do that <coughs> and make the, the business fully knowledgeable of the implications of that. Shift left your engagements with the business. Don't be marking their homework. Help them set the question in the first place and then work with them as they're coming and establishing the answer. That is absolutely the right way to do business in this day and age. And make security business measurable. The technical business me me metrics and measurements are useful within a particular community of practice, but you need to translate those to key business aims and goals and demonstrate your value return in business language, <coughs> which is business aims and goals, profitability, agility, uh, and outcomes. Um, yeah, and it's as simple as that. Um, I, hope that's <coughs> I hope that's been in some way useful. Um, I hope it, it kind of resonates with, uh, with, with, with some of you. Um, has anybody got any, any questions or points they'd like to make? And I think there's a microphone. Got time for a couple of questions, I guess. Yeah. So um, very quickly, um, DevOps is kind of the beating heart of the agi agility in the new IT I environment. Yeah. And we now have this buzzword, uh, SecOps, okay, clearly a lot of software engineers were not, not trained to be security engineers. Any kind of advice on that cultural transformation for their DevOps team to make them SecOps? Um, I interestingly, the, uh, the squads at Domino's have actually come up to me and said, what training and development do we need to think about security by design? So they, they recognise the importance of this within their, within their DevOps space. Um, and the basic stuff we've done at the moment is, is uh, they, they, they've gone and done the, the, uh, the, the 10 critical controls training and that sort of stuff. They're being more, um, more interested in, um, in repeatable processes of, for, of, of design. And we've also started to introduce more regular and iterative processes of static and dynamic code testing into cycles and, and sprints. Um, so not only doing those within the sprints, but also doing those as a regular regime of the current MVP that's in production. Um, so you know our website and our applications uh, iterate and release on a, on a, on a very regular basis. Um, so I, I feel that there's a lot that we still need to do, but I'm comfortable in the fact that they recognise that they are part of the process and they've asked, asked for help. Um, and I think it starts with training and, and education, but give them the opportunity to, uh, um, to, to think about what they need to be doing. Um, them, themselves uh, and meet in the middle. It, it, again, it's, it, it's an area that's moving very, very quickly. And I think the whole principles of shift left still apply in DevOps, to be honest with you. Are we done? Okay. 
no problem. Um, thank you very much for your time. Cheers. Thank you.